good to make an entrance, isn't it? Takes all the water yes. Off the roof. Um, and so we're, air, we're ready to start um, this afternoon session, the very first one. Um, is Jack Hubbard, and he's going to give us information about growing mushrooms. And it's so good to have him. He's young, he's very, very intense about this. So. Hey everybody, my name is Jack. Um, today I'm here to tell you guys about uh, fungi and their many uses, and I'll go over some cultivation basics as well. So, let's get started. Technical difficulties here. Let's try this again. All right. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm 17 and from the Tulsa area, and I've always been passionate about anything having to do with nature, but especially fungi. Um, my first garden interested in mycology when I was 14, and I began cultivating my own mushrooms around the age of 15. And since then, I've become more curious about other life sciences, but um, fungi have always remained close to my heart. Um, I'm honored that you guys have had me here to represent my mycelium, and I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. These are my contacts down here if anybody would care to contact me. So, contrary to what a lot of people might think, mushrooms are not plants. They belong to their own group called the, well, they come from their own group called the Epistocons. You can see right here at this node, they diverge into fungi, animals, and amoeba on this cladogram. You can see they separated from plants around 1,200 million years ago. Um, oftentimes they're divided into higher and lower sub-kingdoms, and the higher fungi, Dicaria, enveloped the Phyllopacidiomycetes and Ascomycetes. A lot like us, fungi are heterotrophs, so they source their energy externally as opposed to internally like a plant would be the process of photosynthesis. They also um, take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide and can even produce their own heat. Um, so they have their own ecological role outside of a typical trophic pyramid. They're these guys right here, the decomposers. So what they do is they break down and they recycle all the dead organic matter and they bring it back through the ecosystem so they're really that driving force of energy in the ecosystem. Um, other fungi known as mycorrhizal fungi will form symbiotic connections with plants and they'll trade minerals like phosphorus um, in exchange for carbohydrates produced by the plants. Um, fungi have a few different lifestyles. Um, they can be saprotrophic, parasitic, or mycorrhizal. The saprotrophs source their energy by decomposing already dead organic material, um, usually wood. And you can see that right here with this oyster mushroom, Pleurotus austriatus. Um, parasitic fungi will source their energy by parasitizing a living host. So that could be a plant host, an animal host, or in the case of Hypomyces lactiflorum, the lobster mushroom, another mushroom host and they'll usually parasitize mushrooms in the genus Lactarius or Rusula. And so they're growing I, on a mushroom? Yes, yeah, this is a mushroom. The, the parasitic mushroom just kind of envelops the already existing Rusula or Lactarius. And then like I mentioned before, there's mycorrhizal fungi. This one here, Morchella americana, the Von Morel, will um, create that connection with the plant to acquire some of its nutrients. Um, we'll go deeper into the saprotrophs. There are the wood lovers. So starting out, there's the brown rot fungi that come in on like a dead log or something, and they will break down the cellulose using um, cellulase enzymes. And then once all that cellulose is broken down, the white rot fungi will come in. And these are lignanolytic. So they use lignanolytic enzymes like lacase, uh, lignin peroxidase, and manganese peroxidase to break down that lignin. There are also grass lovers, like you can see here, with this fruiting of Sathrella candeliana. Um, these grow in that duff underlayer of the forest and in the humus. And then lastly, there are the dung lovers. 
that are coprophilus, <laughs> also known as coprophiles. Oops. And they grow on the dung, usually of large herbivores. And you can see this fruiting here of Protoserferia semilobata. The grass lovers and the dung lovers are pretty similar. The dung lovers just rely more on their spores being passed on through the digestive tracts of herbivorous creatures, while um, the grass lovers rely more on air currents. Um, so now I'll cover the basic anatomy of an agaric mushroom. That means the, mush the umbrella-shaped mushrooms. So starting off, there's the pileus, which is just another word for the cap. Then there's the hymenium, which is the spore surface of the mushroom. The hymenium can be toothed, poured, or it can have lamellae, which is just the fancy word for gills, like you can see here on this Stropharia rugosa lingulata. And um, the gills can be attached to the stem in a lot of different ways, and that can aid in identification. Um, next is the annulus. Not all mushrooms have an annulus. It's also called a veil. Some will have something called a partial veil, or a cortina, um, which disappears as the mushroom matures. And then there's just the stipe, which is another word for the stalk. This is where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, this is the fungal life cycle. So starting out, you have spore germination. Um, a single spore will germinate into monokaryotic hyphae, which is haploid, so it only has one half set of chromosomes. Um, once that monokaryotic hyphae comes across a compatible hypha, those will fuse by the process of plasmogamy. And the cytoplasms will join, but the nuclei stay separate. So it's two haploid nuclei per cell. Um, that dikaryotic mycelium will then grow out as vegetative mycelium, and it will establish itself, grow out into a fruit or a mushroom. And when it's ready to sporulate by the process of karyogamy, those haploid nuclei will fuse to form one diploid nucleus, and then they'll immediately split again by the process of meiosis to create more haploid spores which will then be ejected out into the air by sporulation, and the cycle continues. And here's a visual for you guys to see that life cycle. So starting out from spore, you can see they germinate into this monokaryotic hyphae. They fuse here, and plasmogamy takes place. They grow out as the dikaryotic mycelium, and then fruit. Right along here is where karyogamy and meiosis would be taking place, so you get those diploid nuclei and then they split into haploid spores, the cycle continues. Um, we'll do a deeper dive into spores. They're basically seeds, but for fungi, and it's a fungus's method of passing on its genes, giving rise to that next generation of mushrooms. Um, spores can be either sexual or asexual. These are both sexual spores here, but an example of an asexual spore would be um, conidiospores. Um, they're microscopic, so you can't see singular spores with your naked eye, but they're released in the billions by the mushroom, and that just kind of increases the chances of germination and fusion with another compatible strain. And um, they're created upon the spore-bearing structures, which would be basidia up here from the basidiomyces. These are basidia spores. And down here, these are asci full of ascospores for the ascomycetes. Um, once those spores germinate, they'll send out these little thin threads called hypha, little white threads, and they're only one cell thick. Um, and they grow by excreting enzymes out through their growing tip and then kind of swimming through that enzymatic soup of pre-digested nutrients. And when enough hyphae have amassed, they'll form a mycelium and they can move on to their next stage of life. Also, just something to note about hyphae, this is a trait of the higher fungi, dicaria. They have these little walls here that form individual cellular compartments, and those are called septa, and um, that can just help with fluid loss if the hyphae were to become damaged. Um, mycelium, so as I said, when enough hyphae have a mass, they'll create a mycelium. And that is kind of like the root structure of the mushroom. The majority of it is underground or within the substrate as vegetative mycelium. And that's what does all the nutrient absorption 
and um, it kind of anchors the mushroom in place. I have a question. Sure. Is that what sometimes looks like a spider web? Yes. On top? Okay. Yeah, or like underneath the log, you'll see yeah. mycelium. Yeah, precisely. Um, you can see up here, this is rhizomorphic growth. Um, that's kind of striped for with cultivation just because it seems to perform better. And down here is some tone and toast mycelium. That's the fluffier, less rogy looking mycelium. Um, so once the vegetative mycelium has exhausted its nutrient supply, it needs to produce mushrooms and more spores so that it can keep on going. It needs to preserve its lineage. Um, so fruit formation starts with these little hyphal knots, which then grow into these slightly larger primordia, which then mature into pins, and finally, adult mature fruits that are capable of um, creating spores. And lastly, um, once it's time for the mushroom to release its spores, it will do so in mass. So many spores that in some growing operations, you'll have to wear a, resp a respirator to prevent any like lung issues um, when you go in the fruiting chamber. And just a little fun fact about spores, they, they can get <coughs> so many up in the atmosphere that they act as scaffolding for water droplets and can induce rain, which is of course beneficial to fungi. So they kind of help themselves out in that way. Um, so there's the mushroom biology lesson over. Now we can get into cultivation. Um, cultivation usually follows the same sequence. So they start out on a sugar medium, this is agar, I'll get more into that later. Then they go on to a starch phase, and finally they'll colonize a fibrous substrate. This is sawdust in here, being colonized by some grain spawn. Um, for all these steps, they need to have either no contaminants or very low amounts of contaminants because you don't want other organisms competing with your mycelium. So um, what people will do is sterilize their media, usually in a pressure cooker or an autoclave for bigger operations. Um, and then for the fibrous step, you can just pasteurize. So for the first step is sugar. Um, there are two different types of inoculants, generally. Um, there's agar, which is this gelatinous growth medium. Um, it's really versatile. It can be used in other sciences like botany or microbiology, but for mycology, um, it has a lot of uses. You can isolate spores, germinate spores, um, isolate phenotypes. You can also test liquid culture for spore syringes. And onto liquid culture, this is just a, it's basically a sterile sugar water that the mycelium can survive inside of. And people usually go with the 4% um, dilution rate for their liquid culture. Okay, I'll drink water. Okay, the next phase is starch. So once you have your inoculant, either egg or liquid culture, you can go on to inject that into some sort of grain. And once that grain is colonized, it's called grain spawn. So, like I said earlier, agar liquid culture. You can use multi-spore syringes, but they're not as clean, so it's better to go with the agar liquid culture. Um, and of course, as I said earlier, it needs to be sterile before inoculation. So oftentimes people will pressure cook their grain for 90 minutes at 15 PSI. And down here I just have some of the different varieties of grain that people will use for this stage. Um, some factors to consider for this um, step are moisture, airflow, and temperature. Um, the moisture level within the grain is determined by how long it's been boiled, and the boiling time is dependent on what type of grain you use. Um, so that can just kind of throw off your mushrooms colonization if you don't have proper moisture levels. Next is fresh air exchange. The mycelium, of course, needs to breathe. Um, if it doesn't have enough passive airflow, the growth will stall and you'll just have basically dead mycelium. And you can see these filters, these little white air filters down here, can filter out contaminants while allowing for 
fresh air exchange. And those will just go on top of the grain jars. And then temperature um, is an important factor in incubation, but it's mostly species dependent. So um, some species do well at room temperature, others prefer it cold, and some like it hot. Um, and a practice that's common with this step is called the break and shake. So once you have about 30 to 40% colonization, you can break apart that colonized area and shake it all around with the uncolonized grain. And what that does is it creates more inoculation points, which will then accelerate growth. Um, right here are some up close shots under a stereoscope. These are just individual grains of brown rice, and you can see the mycelium kind of taking over, um, colonizing that grain. So, once you have the fully colonized grain spawn, you'll be able to move on to the fiber step, and what that entails is something called spawning to bulk which refers to mixing your grain spawn with that fibrous substrate, which could be um, sawdust, straw, um, cocoa coir, wood shavings, stuff like that. And you mix that at a 50% to 10% spawn rate. And for this step, sterility is less important because the mycelium will already have an established immune system. Um, so pasteurization, is pretty important for this step. It's kind of the bare minimum. Um, you can pasteurize with heat just by pour, pouring boiling water over the substrate. Um, there's also chemical pasteurization with calcium hydroxide or anaerobic <coughs> pasteurization that just involves water. Um, <laughs> uh, some, some mushrooms, though, will only grow on sawdust. So that does require uh, full sterilization, especially if um, it's supplemented sawdust. And the last step of the growing process is fruiting. So once you have that fully colonized substrate, you'll want to induce fruiting conditions, which just refers to the proper light, airflow, temperature, and humidity conditions. And um, it's all species dependent, a lot of it is. And it can even change as the mushroom matures. So case in point, this is the maitake mushroom. When it's young, it prefers high CO2 and low oxygen conditions. But as the mushrooms mature, that'll switch and they'll prefer high oxygen, low CO2. And if you don't provide those specific conditions, it can come out looking pretty weird. Um, I'll just go over a few methods now. So in nature, excuse me. Sure. In nature, how does that mushroom find a place that's high in carbon dioxide and then later low in carbon dioxide? And so it'll grow up through the duff layer, the under layer uh -huh. of the forest. And so as it starts off underneath the layer, it can't have a lot of oxygen underneath oh, there. Right. So it prefers the low oxygen. But then it comes up and breaks through that layer okay. and has the oxygen exposure and then it can fully mature. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll just go over some methods that are used to grow mushrooms. Um, for a few of these, I've included the full process, but I probably won't have time to give a detailed description of each one. So if you'd like to take any photos, um, feel free. So starting off with mushroom beds, um, these are a really low-tech an easy way of getting choice edible mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms usually, but King Scherferia are another good one. These ones right here, Scherferia Rigoso Angulata. Um, they can be grown by themselves, but they can also be grown alongside garden plants, and they tend to perform even better when they're grown alongside plants. But the process pretty much just entails um, layering cardboard, wood chips, hydrated straw, and grain spawn over and over, kind of like you're making a lasagna. And um, then you wait two to 11 months for colonization and fruiting, and you should have some mushrooms. Two to 11 months. Um, next up is log cultivation. Logs are a good way to grow um, 
wood lovers outside, and these can produce for quite some time as well. Um, a good rule of thumb, it is for every one inch of diameter of your log, it'll produce one year's worth of mushrooms. So um, it, it involves drilling holes inside of the log and inoculating either with spawn plugs or sawdust spawn. And then you cover each hole with melted wax and also either into the log to retain moisture and because obviously, like I mentioned, moisture levels are important for mushroom cultivation. And then you just uh, keep those logs warm. That's why it's usually best to inoculate during the spring and then put them outside, let them do their thing, and you'll have mushrooms. Um, straw cultivation. So straw is probably the most common substrate used for gourmet mushrooms, and it's also very cost effective and a versatile substrate. You can see um, right here some artificial logs with straw, and these are oysters being grown out of a bucket, also with straw. Um, it also only requires pasteurization, so you don't have to go through the process of sterilizing, which can sometimes be inconvenient. Uh, next up is sawdust. This is a trickier method. It's more prone to contamination, but you can get pretty good yields off of a good supplemented sawdust block. Um, it pretty much just involves mixing hardwood fuel pellets, so oak is what I usually opt for, um, hot water and wheat or oat bran or soy holes um, in that ratio. And for every one cup of fuel pellets you use, that should render about one pound of substrate in the end. Okay, monotubs. These are a very common method for at-home cultivation, and they're good for top-fruiting mushrooms, so mushrooms that will grow directly up out of the ground. Um, usually, people use this method for cultivating psilocybes, so those psilocybin-active mushrooms, but they can also be used for um, piapino, chestnut, oysters, reishi, and a number of other mushrooms but it just involves modifying a plastic tote by um, cutting air holes and covering those with um, an air filter or stuffing them with polyfill to filter out airborne contaminants. And um, they're pretty high maintenance. They usually need to be fanned to allow for more airflow and misted to keep up the humidity once to twice a day to maintain surface conditions, which you can see here, all these little droplets on top of the mycelium. And if anybody is wanting to do a monotub, it's best to go with a 50% spawn rate, so one-to-one -one spawn to substrate ratio, because um, monotubs, for whatever reason, can be kind of prone to contamination, like you can see right up here with this trick of <coughs> this monotub. All right, um, cordyceps, this is one of my favorite mushrooms to grow. Um, the cordyceps mushroom, it's very medicinal, and it skips the fiber stage altogether. So it can fruit directly off of an enriched cake made up of brown rice. Um, usually, it'll fruit off of insects, which I have a picture of later on in the slideshow, but um, it can also do just fine on the brown rice. And here's an up-close shot of some cordyceps. Cordyceps are cool because these tendrils here aren't the fruiting body. This is just something called the stroma, which is what brings the, these little orange dots, the parathesia, up off the ground, and that's what then disperses the spores. <coughs> and I think this is the last technique I'll be covering. This is the PF tech. This is an ancient tech. Um, it was popularized by Professor Robert McPherson, who also went by the name um, Psilocybe fanaticus, <laughs> and of course, it's used for the psilocybe mushrooms. But this is really simple. It involves mixing two parts of vermiculite, one part brown rice flour, and one part water to create what's known as a BRF cake, which is short for brown rice flour cake, which has been sterilized, inoculated with a mushroom of your choice, and, um, and then you can just go from there. 
All right, so now we have those methods out of the way. I'll show you guys some of the most commonly cultivated legal species. Um, so we'll start off with the oyster mushrooms. These are a very hardy, very resilient mushroom that are really forgiving for beginners. So if any of you here are wanting to get into mushroom cultivation, this is the species to start out with. Um, there, any, any mushroom within the genus Pleurotus is an oyster mushroom, but the most common are gonna be these pink oysters, blue oysters, golden oysters, and king oysters. Um, they incubate in fruit at room temperature. They don't have any crazy um, like humidity or airflow requirements. Just keep it high and they're, they're happy. And just a cool thing about these oyster mushrooms, they're nematocidal, which means they will actually ensnare nematodes inside of their hyphae and um, digest them externally as a source of nitrogen, which means they are a predatory mushroom. Gardeners could probably use some oh, yeah. <laughs> they think they're nematodes. Yeah, definitely. Um, next up is the lion's mane mushroom. So you can see here, it's this really cool looking mushroom, kind of looks like a lion's mane, like a white lion's mane. Um, this is common throughout Oklahoma and kind of just throughout the northern hemisphere. Um, especially during the fall, you can forage the lion's mane mushroom. And it not only tastes good, but it is highly medicinal. Um, it contains compounds called hericinones in the fruiting body and irinacines in the vegetative mycelium. And both of these compounds, you can see down here, the hericinones and the irinacine, irinacine K. Um, both of these promote the production of nerve growth factor in the body, which repairs damaged nerves and um, can even form new connections in the brain. Um, these compounds also have a lot of promise for curing or treating cognitive diseases, so Alzheimer's, for example. What it'll do is reduce inf inflammation in the brain, and it can also break down amyloid plaques, which are just misfolded proteins that are in between nerve cells. So it also helps with neuropathy. So if you eat these, um, since they have so many medicinal uses, what if, does it do anything to you then? I mean, because you're just, you're just eating them for taste, right? Yeah, um, the absorption of the compounds will be slightly hindered, I've heard between 10 to 50 percent absorption, but it's best if you're going to consume it for medicinal use to consume like a dual extracted tincture or oh. dual extracted powders. Okay. Um, next up, this is one of my all-time favorites as well. This is the reishi mushroom, again, or lucidum. There are other reishi mushrooms that are cultivated, for example, the black reishi, Ganoderma sinense, but um, the medicinal one that's most ubiquitous is going to be the red reishi, Ganoderma lucidum. Um, this it has slightly sedative effects, and it also has anti-inflammatory and immunomodulating properties. So that means it can fight against autoimmune disorders, but it can also bolster the immune system if you have any deficiencies. And so that is, of course, why it's dubbed the mushroom of immortality. Um, it has a mixture of polysaccharides, peptidoglycans, and triterpenes. As you can see some of those triterpenes right here, these ganoderic acids. And during cultivation, you can see there are these antler shapes and this conch shapes growth, and that is all determined by CO2 levels. So the antler growth um, is usually indicative of high CO2, so the mushroom will stretch up trying to reach for that oxygen. And then once it finds it, it'll conk out and kind of widen like that, which I think is kind of neat. Um, a mushroom that is sometimes overlooked as a medicinal mushroom and generally seen as a gourmet mushroom is maitake. Um, this also grows all throughout the northern hemisphere, especially during the fall, normally at the base of oak trees and it can start out as a parasite to an already living oak tree, and then once it kills the tree, it will revert to a saprotrophic lifestyle, which means this is a transient fungus, because it can switch back and forth between 
um, lifestyles. Um, it's commonly foraged and grown, and um, they contain refolins, which are a type of beta-glucan, which is a polysaccharide that gets synthesized by the maitake mushroom. And refolins um, can reduce unhealthy cholesterol levels and just benefits overall cardiovascular health and immunity. And right down here you can see uh, refolin frondosa polysaccharide, GFP for short, that's called the blue fraction of polysaccharide. Um, I believe, yeah, the last mushroom we have is cordyceps. This is the one I specialize in cultivating. Um, it's that intima pathogenic fungus, so you can see it fruiting off what looks like a silkworm pupae. Um, and it has high concentrations of cordycepin, which has a lot of different effects on humans. Um, it has stimulating effects, so it's an energy booster, but it's not a central nervous system stimulant like caffeine is, so it doesn't squeeze your adrenal glands. Um, what people think it does is catalyzes ATP synthesis, adenosine triphosphate, which then increases efficiency and uptake of oxygen in the cells. And if anybody here knows what the ATP molecule looks like, you'll see that cortisepin has a very similar structure, it just lacks that triphosphate group. And similar to reishi, it has anti-inflammatory and immunomodulating properties. So now that I've shown everybody um, the different types of mushrooms, how to cultivate these mushrooms, we can get into the applications of fungi. So we'll start off. Can you talk for one minute about the feather tail or the turkey? Yeah. Yeah, um, so a mushroom I didn't cover is called the turkey tail mushroom, Tremides versicolor. And it's been shown to have a lot of promise. Actually, you can see an image of it right here. This is the turkey tail mushroom. It has a lot of promise um, working in conjunction with chemotherapy, um, especially for breast cancer. Um, like reishi, it can suppress tumor growth or even kill tumor cells. Um, and it's also just really good for um, immunomodulation. Um, but as I showed you guys in these past few slides, mushrooms, of course, have a lot of medicinal value um, for physical and mental illnesses. Um, they've been used for thousands of years as medicine, but today, in the modern world, people are able to isolate them and use them for pharmaceuticals. I think there's value in using them traditionally or modernly. Um, <coughs> yeah, just overall really beneficial, a good kingdom to have at our fingertips. Um, I also think it's interesting that anybody can cultivate their own mushrooms and thereby create their own medicine. Another really promising application of fungi is microremediation, which is a form of bioremediation. And bioremediation is the use of living things to remove contaminants um, or pollutants from the environment. Um, so in that facet of, micro, of bioremediation, microremediation uses fungi to break down waste and pollutants, um, like usually hydrocarbons, like oil. And you can see right here some oil contaminated straw that's been inoculated with this oyster mushroom. Um, it goes in and it remediates the oil breaks those hydrocarbons down into inert compounds in aerobic conditions, and it can then fruit, fruit right off of that oil-soaked substrate. And it's not contaminated or anything, right? No, yeah. Uh, hypothetically, um, since it's inert compounds, you could eat these mushrooms. Um, next up, I'm sure you guys will like this, um, mycorrhizae. So mycorrhizae is um, fungal symbiosis with plants. So 95% of plants have a mycorrhizal relationship of some sort. And of those mycorrhizae, 95% of those species are um, endophytes. So they're 
endomycorrhizal, it means they penetrate into the cortical cell of the root, and it doesn't create a fruiting body. So it's an obligate symbiote. Um, but their purpose is to optimize a plant's uptake of moisture and nutrients, like I mentioned earlier with the phosphorus, and they get glucose in exchange from the plants. Um, there are a few different types of mycorrhizal fungi. There's ectomycorrhizal, which means they grow around the roots of the plant, uh, kind of forming a sheath. And then there's endomycorrhizal, which actually goes into the cells of the plant. There's also ectendomycorrhizal, which is basically just ectomycorrhizae that will occasionally go down to those cortical cells. Um, pest control, you can see here, this is Ophiocordyceps unilateralis um, parasitizing an ant of some type. But um, any, any fungus that will parasitize and then digest insects are called entomopathogenic fungi. And these have a lot of utility in protecting homes from things like termites or ants or even ticks. Um, there's a species called Metarhizium robertsii, I believe, and that is um, really good at parasitizing ticks, so I'm sure a lot of you guys would like to have that around. So I certainly would. And uh, the spores from these fungi can infiltrate that colony of the insects, kill everything, sporulate, and then they'll just stay there. So it'll protect your home from any subsequent invasions. And something cool about these mushrooms is they are host specific. <coughs> so you take like a artificial insecticide, they aren't specific. They could, they could kill roaches, but they could also kill butterflies. But these entomopathogenic fungi will target a specific species of insect and only go after them and leave the butterflies alone or the bees or anything else. And what is it they leave behind that? Spores. They'll just leave their spores behind, and um, any pests that might walk through them can become no. inoculated and mummified. So this mushroom just feeds off of that. Yep. And kills it. Yeah, exactly. I think we need more of that. <laughs> 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 Where do we get these? <laughs> All right. Uh, the last thing I have for this section um, is a mushroom mushrooms use in textiles. So a lot of Mycelium from certain species has very high tensile strength, which means they can be used in creating really durable textiles, sometimes even more durable than animal-based leather. And that's, of course, a good thing because we want to be moving away from that with the use of toxic chemicals that can harm the environment that are involved in leather production. And this has been around for a really long time. Um, some really old um, villages, like in Transylvania, will still make something called Amadou, which is also called German leather, which is a felt that comes from the mushroom Fomis fomentarius. And you can see a picture of that German leather right here. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Um, there's a guy named Paul Stamets. He has a, yeah, you know, he has a hat made out of mushroom felt. Um, so yeah. So is there any place in the United States where this is being done? Um, I don't think it's being created in the United States, at least Amadou. I know there are some uh, leather alternatives being created out of the reishi mushroom here in the United States, but no German film. How, how cost effective is that? Is it? Um, it's, I feel like a lot of it is just dependent on how common the mushroom is just growing mm -hmm. out of the wild. Because Amadou, the hoof fungus is kind of difficult to cultivate. Yep. But that concludes the presentation. Um, we have about seven minutes left. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer. Right here, I have all my contact information again. If anybody wants to email me or check out my YouTube and Instagram pages. So, yeah, thank Where you. Where can you buy most of these, um, other than just the ordinary bed mushroom? Oh, um, farmers markets are probably the best most okay. accessible place. Yeah. But like in the winter time, you're not going to find Um Well, Nam High. So, yeah, Nam High. Nam High is a good place in Tulsa. Um, I don't know where that is. But it's, it's an Asian 
grocery store. Oh, 21st Street. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Sure. At our farmer's market, uh, the mushroom growers actually told me that it's easier to grow mushrooms in the winter because in the summer it gets too hot for them uh, and it kills them, but in the, in the winter it doesn't. So you can actually buy them in the winter easier. Yep. It, as long as the farmers markets are still open, uh -huh. that's the only problem. Sometimes they close. Yeah, yeah the lot cultivation is done. In right, the right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I am amazed at your age <laughs> and your breadth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. How Thank did you. you come into this? And how did you gain your expertise, Jack? Um, well, I got started off, um, I've always been kind of involved with foraging wild mushrooms and wild edible plants, and eventually I just decided I wanted to try my hand at growing my own, and I sort of had a knack for it, and I just kept on learning, kept on researching, and I, I guess I've discovered my passion. So what's your educational background? Um, senior in high school. <laughs> <laughs> any um, way, just an easy way to separate edible mushrooms from poisonous or how to recognize them? I wish there was. Um, there's not. It's, it's, you just have to it's try all, it Yeah, it's all research-based. You just gotta make sure you know what you're about to consume before doing so. Well, the, you know, like the morels that they find in the, I mean, uh, in the fields here. Um, the people who've done it for years don't hesitate to go out and yeah, yeah. A lot of that is uh, passed down mm -hmm. through family members too. Uh, Morels even have some not deadly, but um, not really edible lookalikes. Uh, they they also have a pretty distinctive look, so they're they're hard to miss out. But they don't like to share those. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Is this a good time of year to hunt for mushrooms? Um. I think any time of year is a good time. It just depends on what species you're looking for. So like with fall coming up, or actually right upon us now, um, lion's mane and maitake are some good candidates. Do you have a question? Me? Uh, yeah. Why, in nature, they just propagate by themselves. Mm -hmm. Why, when you do it at home, you have to sterilize and all this kind of stuff? Um, well, <coughs> the the Genetic strains out of nature are naturalized, so they have a really high-performing immune system. So, um, and that gets passed down through spores. Um, so they're just kind of like, it's kind of like if you have a wolf out in the wild, it can fit for itself, but if you were to put a pug out in the wild, it would die. It's kind of like that. Any other questions? Yes. So when you buy those little mushroom kits now at the garden centers, is the growing media coming from that brown rice mixture that you were talking about? Yeah, um, usually, I, I, I want to say it's millet that's used in the larger operations, but it'll just be millet um, inoculated into supplemented sawdust and then colonized, and then they sell that colonized brick. And all you have to do is cut a hole, keep it humid, and yeah. you have your mushrooms. Okay. From what you're saying, it would seem to me that, you know, the wild mushroom would, by nature, by its whatever, uh, have more of these properties of um, uh, medicinal properties than the cultivated ones would, um, simply because you're sterilizing. No, 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 but that's no. just the medium. That's the medium. That's, that's, that's the medium. Well, it's just the yeah, medium. medium. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you lose some of those properties in the process of, of cultivating them so that you, know, you could grow a whole bunch of them. So that this little box of mushrooms that you buy may not be nearly as good as the one that you harvest. Yeah, yeah, a lot of alkaloid concentration is just um, dependent on genetics. So it's it doesn't really matter a whole lot um, if it's wild or cultivated okay. as far as alkaloid content goes. Okay. Anybody that would be similar to a lot of our native plants where you know some of them are cultivated we can yeah. go to the garden center and buy them and some of them we only find in pastures or in wild spaces right 
and then you have the, the cultivated ones that then become a cultivar, you know, from what we've done with them or selecting them. So the mushrooms is kind of that same thought, I mean, like for which strains and if that makes sense. Yep. Is there, uh, economically, is it significant in this country at this point? I mean, are we growing? Uh, in just our to use cultivate of, mushrooms in general. But just, are we growing in our use? Because we know that they're good for us. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would say there's a pretty high demand, especially in the past few years, for um, medicinal mushrooms. Um, the film Fantastic Fungi came out, and that really highlighted a lot of the medicinal aspects of mushrooms and kind of made people warm up to mycology as a whole. And so it's, it's becoming more mainstream now than it has in the past few decades. I don't yes. know if this question's been answered because people keep asking the same kind of question, but the non market, was that for edible mushrooms to buy or was yeah. that to get the spores? My uh, question is, is there a local resource for local spores to throw out into your woodlock to see if they can grow in a natural environment? Yeah, Nam Pai is just, it's just the Asian grocery store. Um, yeah, it's just edible mushrooms, like king oyster, um, and no mushrooms. But can you get the spores out of them? Like they would say if you, if you harvest a mushroom and walk in a, in a you know, burlap sack, that the spores mm -hmm. will fall out? Uh, yeah, you, you could. What, what I've done actually is I've gone to Namhai and I've bought a king oyster mushroom and I took a tissue sample and I cloned it. And that's what I have is my king oyster strain that a year and a half later I still have going. So is there a local resource for the spores? Um, not, not a local resource. Uh, if you're interested in sourcing spores, I'd just go online. And there's, you can email me if you'd like, and I'll send you some websites. It's, um, uh, it's a true that some mushrooms can only grow in certain areas? Like yes. Yeah, um, they, they rely on a lot of different factors for their growth, um, especially the type of substrate. Um, or with the case of mycorrhizal mushrooms, um, like the morel, it, it will need specific trees to grow in association with. So like if you were to plant, you could plant 100 pounds of morel spawn, but if there aren't any oak trees around, nothing's gonna grow. Yeah, um, you know the what they call fairy rings that you see out in the in pasture sometimes. What kind of mushroom is that? Uh, usually, well, fairy ring can refer to a lot of different so, mushrooms. Yeah, types, it's like the re it's from the yeah. Most commonly, it'll be those big white mushrooms. That's one called Chlorophyllum molybdates, and it's also known as the vomiter. So <laughs> it's, it's not, not good not mushroom to eat. <laughs> <laughs> It won't kill you, but you'll wish that it had. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a good mushroom that comes from those fairy rings? Um, there, there's the parasol mushroom. I don't think they typically grow in a ring, but they look a lot like the vomiter mushroom, and that's a perfectly good as a mushroom. Macrolidia de Procera is what it's called, and you can, you can fry that, eat it however you want. But you're taking your chances if you... Yeah, yeah you, should, you should know how to identify it first. So do you eat them every day? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> parasol mushroom. Parasol mushroom was it? Parasol mushroom. They're they're not super common in Oklahoma, but um, I think people have found them in Oklahoma. You, you talked about uh, medicinal values. In your opinion, is there a best nutritional mushroom? Um. Well, I mean, oyster mushrooms are pretty nutritional. Um, I focus mostly on the medicinal aspects, but um, yeah, that's that's a great question for people, probably. Well, is that everyone? Thank you guys for having me. Oh, we've got one more question here. Uh, one more. Favorite reference book or guide? Um, I, I most of what I learned has just been from the internet. Um, Reddit has been a really good resource for me, but as far as books go, pretty much anything by, by Paul Stamets yeah. is good. Um, there's a book called, uh, what's it called? Uh, Fungal, 
I think it's called Fungal Biology and the Emergence of Life, or something along those lines. Um, there's another book called The Kingdom of Fungi, which is a good one. But yeah. Yes? What uh, would you say to a Native American who would argue this should be kept to us? It's part of our rituals. And other, you know, what else they're gonna take away from us? Well, I would just say a lot of the fungi I've just presented are prevalent all over the globe. So I don't think any one culture has a right to any species at all. Even if it is only found in one part of the world, I think the world is here with everybody, all humans, not just one culture. Well, let's thank you. Thank you. Sorry, they couldn't bring it. Oh, you're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Still recording.